So uh, welcome everyone. And uh, again, thank you for attending today's cardiac amyloidosis webinar called Transitioning from Outreach to Reaching Out. I am joined by uh, excellent speakers and world experts in, in this field. Um, Dr. Robert Miller is from Calgary, and Dr. Ryan Davy and Dr. Sabe Day are uh, our own Western, uh, and Dr. Ruddy is joining from Ottawa Heart Institute. I will just uh, briefly go over our agenda and learning objectives. Oops. And so um, we're hoping. Um, that uh, the audience at the end of this session will be able to identify clinical and echocardiographic red flags for cardiac amyloidosis and describe who should be referred for further testing and nuclear imaging, recognize diagnostic pathways and identifying and differentiating um, AL versus ATTR cardiac amyloidosis, as well as we will go over the guidelines for imaging and treatment of cardiac amyloidosis. My first speaker is Dr. Robert Miller from Calgary. Dr. Robert Miller is an associate professor in the Department of Cardiac Sciences at the University of Calgary, and he is the medical director of nuclear cardiology and cardiac CT program. Um, he has completed his training in Calgary and went on to do an advanced training in heart failure and cardiac transplantation in Stanford. Thank you, uh, University and advanced cardiac imaging at Cedar Sinai Medical Center. His clinical work also includes nuclear cardiology, cardiac CT, and advanced heart failure service. Um, so today he will be uh, talking to us about. The, the first, very first uh, objectives of, of how to identify these patients. Thanks, thanks, doctor. Tatum. That was great. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly a longer introduction than I probably needed, but <laughs> uh, we'll be talking about identifying patients with amyloidosis. And then we'll talk about the initial workup. And then you'll see, I think, over the course of the, the plenary that Cheatham has laid out, you're going to really see things from the beginning all the way through the end to treatment. So uh, thanks again for the introduction. Um, before I start, I do have some conflicts uh, just to disclose. So I get um, some research funding through Pfizer for amyloidosis related work. Uh, and then I get funding also through Alberta Innovates for machine learning related work that's uh, unrelated to my discussion today. Um, so as mentioned, we have three major learning objectives for today. We're going to start by talking about identifying red flags for cardiac amyloidosis. We'll talk about the initial diagnostic pathways for amyloidosis, and you'll see this really goes along two separate paths. Uh, and then we'll talk about some ways to minimize diagnostic delays. Uh, but just so we're all on the same page in terms of, of why we're here and why we're discussing this, uh, I think we all learned about amyloid during medical school. And at least when I went through, we didn't talk about amyloid a lot because it didn't seem to be a major issue. Um, there are many types of amyloid. We tend to boil it down to two specific types of amyloid. It's transthyretin cardiac amyloid and AL or light chain related amyloid. This is just looking at the process for uh, ATTR uh, amyloid deposition. So we all have transthyretin that exists in a stable tetramer form and it lives in equilibrium with these dimers as well as the monomers. And the monomers can enter this misfolded state that eventually form aggregates and deposit as amyloid. Uh, similar processes exist for light chain amyloid. The difference is there the light chains themselves just form uh, amy uh, amyloid fibrils and can deposit. Um, and certainly what we're seeing uh, in most centers is an increase in the prevalence or at least recognition of amyloid. Uh, so this is data from a Japanese administrative database looking at the prevalence of uh, ATTR uh, wild type or hereditary ATTR patients with heart failure over time. 
And you can see that over the short course of this study, it was really just uh, from 2012 to 2018. So over six years, there was a more than doubling in the prevalence of amyloid. And a lot of this is just related to increased recognition and diagnosis. Uh, and the interesting thing is, if you look at a more broad definition, not all patients with ATTR will present with uh, a heart failure. Uh, you can see that there is a pretty significant prevalence increase, even if you look at patients without uh, heart failure as a portion of this definition. So we all know that there's a lot of amyloid out there. The other thing we know is that we're not great at finding it. So this is a study that looked at the uh, mean diagnostic delay over a set of different cohorts. And this was a meta-analysis looking at the mean delay. And you can see that for here, each of the circles is a, a study. You can see that the mean diagnostic delay for a hereditary ATTR patient across all the studies was over five years. And if you look at uh, wild type ATTR, it was even a little bit longer uh, from time to first uh, presentation with symptoms to time to diagnosis. So we know that this goes on for years before it's recognized. Um, so honestly, the biggest way to avoid a diagnostic delay is to think about it. And the best way to think about it is to figure out what clues you're going to use to find it. Um, as a cardiologist, I'm a little bit biased because I do primarily heart failure cardiology. So most of the amyloid I see is uh, in patients with heart failure. And typically here we see patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Certainly we see patients with reduced ejection fraction as well. However, these patients are also more prone to other disorders, including atrial fibrillation, conduction system disease. Certainly the combination of those two is also quite common in our ATTR patients, so sick sinus syndrome and tachybrady syndromes. Uh, patients can have ventricular arrhythmias, like the patient who was just admitted to my service last night. Um, and aortic stenosis, especially this low flow, low gradient uh, phenotype is pretty prototypical for an ATTR because it's older patients, big thick ventricles that don't have great function and thick valves. So it gives them this low flow, low gradient AS um, presentation. Uh, this is uh, just from the Canadian guidelines in terms of presentations, but in terms of being practical, they said, well, you should screen anybody with heart failure with at least one of the following. Uh, so either if they have an established diagnosis of AL or ATTR in a non-cardiac organ, so this frequently comes up for us when uh, pathologists are staining things with Congo red that normally we wouldn't think to stain. So we have a cohort of patients where we found uh, ATTR cardiomyopathy uh, based on initially a gallbladder that had transthyretin amyloid uh, deposition. Uh, we see lots of patients with bilateral peripheral neuropathies, especially bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome is common, uh, bicep tendon rupture. If you have unexplained increased wall thickness, um, oftentimes this is attributed to hypertension that was transient and resolved, but that's also a reasonable presentation of uh, ATTR cardiomyopathy. And again, what you see is this low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis is a cohort that has been highlighted time and time again. And there have been several studies looking at different populations that could be screened for cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, this first study here looked at patients that had uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but without significant increase in the wall thickness. And 5% of those patients had ATTR cardiomyopathy. If, if you just screen everybody with HEFPEF, including patients that have left ventricular hypertrophy, about 6% of the patients had ATTR cardiomyopathy. Uh, there was a cohort looking at patients referred with possible hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the important thing about that study is they excluded patients with known genetic mutations. And there was a lot of uh, genetic testing for HCM, uh, but they found 9% of those patients had cardiac amyloid if there wasn't a clear cause for their uh, HCM phenotype. And lastly, again, is this TABR population where uh, in this one study, they found 16% of patients had cardiac amyloid. And again, a lot of those are the low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis patients. Um, there's 
various ways to refine these populations a little bit more. So this was a cohort that was uh, TABR patients uh, where you could either incorporate an NT pro BNP. What I'd say is I've never really seen a lot of uh, TABI patients age over 70 with an NT pro PMP less than a thousand. But in this study, they use this as a splitting point where if the NT pro BNP was higher, there was a much higher prevalence of ATTR. Uh, whereas if the BNP was normal, um, only 1% of patients had ATTR cardiomyopathy. Uh, but again, all of this comes down to even just thinking about it, because we know the diagnostic workup for ca cardiac amyloid is highly accurate. So it's really deciding who to screen for it. Um, outside of the hearts, and I think we have some people who aren't cardiologists on this call, um, a lot of these manifestations are, are really more obvious for internists and certainly hematologists and neurologists see a lot of these presentations more frequently than we do as cardiologists. Uh, so renal dysfunction, especially in the AL population, is more common, including nephrotic syndrome. We see lots of autonomic disturbances, so orthostatic hypotension, gastroparesis, sweating abnormalities are common. We talked very briefly about the neurologic presentations. Um, but I think most neurologists see amyloid very differently than me because they see patients with hereditary polyneuropathy as the presentation. Certainly if they have that diagnosis, it's reasonable to screen them for cardiac involvement. Uh, but in terms of uh, presentation for cardiologists and internal medicine physicians, uh, the combination of heart failure with carpal tunnel syndrome or heart failure with spinal stenosis should be a clue to us to think about this. Uh, there's lots of MSK presentations. A lot of these are nonspecific. Cachexia and weight loss are difficult. But if you see somebody who has macroglossia, that's a strong hint about uh, AL cardiac amyloid. Or if they have bicep tendon rupture, that's quite frequent in ATTR cardiomyopathy. Uh, GI disturbances are very common, including nausea, constipation. Some patients have IBS type symptoms. And then easy ble uh, bleeding and bruising is very common in the AL population. Um, so in terms of all of these things, if you put them together, it's people that have a lot of nonspecific things that sort of come together in a pattern that would make you think that maybe there's something systemic causing this patient's heart failure or this patient's neuropathy. Uh, this is just a pictorial representation of what AL cardiac amyloid can present because there's some things that are, are quite obvious on exam occasionally, including this periorbital purpura and macroglossia, especially if they get indentations or scalloping along the tongue that's uh, highly suggestive of AL cardiac amyloid or AL amyloid in general. Um, but again, it's this combination of cardiovascular disease or neuropathy with other manifestations that make you think about a systemic disease. So once you've found somebody who has uh, symptoms that make you think about this, so what are the next steps? So this is just the um, Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines for cardiac amyloidosis uh, workup. Um, there's some differences in terms of how people actually approach this from a practical perspective. Uh, so the way it was presented was to screen for plasma cell dyscrasia up front. And if there is a plasma cell dyscrasia, you really should go down this AL pathway first. And that's because AL amyloid is, is much more urgent to diagnose, whereas ATTR, we know the treatments take a while to improve um, symptoms. So there's less urgency to that diagnosis. On uh, the side with monoclonal protein absent, then you can go down this ATTR pathway uh, that uh, is gonna be discussed in a lot more detail later. Uh, so a common question is, well, why does it really matter which type of amyloid they have? Once they have amyloid, um, they can just go to amyloid clinic. Um, so it matters because the treatment courses are very different. Uh, so this is the ATTRACT trial that looked at the use of tefamidus in patients with ATTR. And what you see is that over time, there was a net benefit to this pool tefamidus arm. Uh, and they had this complex um, ranked outcome. But the short version of it is uh, it takes about 12 months before you see a major difference in outcomes. But over time, there is a benefit to tefamidus in terms of uh, cardiovascular related hospitalizations, as well as all cause mortality with a hazard ratio of 0 
But what you see is it takes a while to accrue this benefit uh, with tapamidus. So it's not an emergency to diagnose it, but certainly we want to catch these people early because we know there's benefit to early treatment and ongoing treatment. Uh, with AL amyloid, there's also been dramatic improvements in, in uh, treatment. And again, the hematologists in the audience, if there are any, will know that the field of treatment for AL amyloid and multiple myeloma has really transformed a lot over the last uh, several years. Uh, this is just a study using daratumumab. So this is in patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And you can see that with daratumumab, there's an excellent response rate with 82% of patients having uh, at least a very good partial response, uh, but also about 50% having some version of a complete response. Um, and you can see that this complete response is uh, really impressive uh, for a renal response, 83%, and still very good from a cardiac uh, perspective, 53%. So for AL, it's actually an emergency. You really want to start them on treatment as soon as possible because the treatments work really well if they're started on time. We're going to talk about other ways that you can sort of get information about this diagnosis. And the next talk is going to be all about echo. So I'm not going to belabor this point too much. But we know there are some features on echo that are going to be highly suggestive. Um, certainly uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, the speckled appearance, pericardial effusions are common. There's a lot of uh, weight given to this apical sparing uh, strain pattern. Uh, the one caveat I would say is a lot of this data comes from highly selected populations with advanced disease. We're not sure how well this works in patients with mild disease, especially on the ATTR side. Uh, cardiac MRI, um, certainly in Calgary, we love to do cardiac MRI anytime we can because um, we just like it. Uh, you can see similar uh, findings as what you would see on echo where you see left ventricular hypertrophy. You can see that there's relative sparing of the apical segments for contractility. Uh, the classic thing is uh, reversed myocardial nulling or abnormal myocardial nulling. And you can get diffuse subendocardial LG that's beyond a, uh, one vascular distribution. So all of those would be highly suggestive of amyloid. What we know is probably a bit more sensitive is this uh, tissue characterization. So this was uh, a patient with ATTR cardiac amyloid that had abnormal global T1. And on this ECV map, you can see that it's even more impressive with uh, the distribution of the subendocardial LGE. There's quite uh, abnormal ECV in the same distribution. Um, so this is also something that could be helpful in patients with suspected amyloid, especially more along patients with AL amyloid, where you're not quite sure if there's cardiac involvement. This is what we use quite frequently in our patients with multiple myeloma that may or may not have heart failure yet. And we're just trying to get a sense of whether or not there is cardiac involvement. Um, so again, just coming back to this algorithm for how to investigate patients, you can see on the AL amyloid side, most important thing is hematology referral. Um, and our hematologists are excellent in, in providing us supports. And I think most hematologists across the country are excellent in providing support for uh, amyloidosis diagnosis. Uh, our group will typically do a bone marrow uh, biopsy as well as a fat pad aspirate up front. Uh, we know that bone marrow biopsy staining for amyloid is uh, certainly not 100% sensitive for AL amyloid. There is incremental benefit from doing the fat pad aspirate. Uh, many of our patients that we think have AL cardiac amyloid, that initial workup will be negative and we'll proceed uh, to a cardiac biopsy to make the diagnosis. Um, we uh, will typically do that, especially if patients are a candidate for a clinical trial where we need a tissue diagnosis. Um, some patients we go without the biopsy if the plan for treatment is already uh, determined in terms of a multiple myeloma perspective. Um, so again, this is sort of what our hematology colleagues uh, do for us, which is um, this uh, fat pad aspirate and bone marrow biopsy. Um, renal biopsy is also quite sensitive if there's uh, renal involvement, either by proteinuria or by renal dysfunction. Uh, and then we have a cohort of patients that we did uh, carpal tunnel biopsies on. 
Uh, so patients that have AL with concurrent carpal tunnel symptoms will do a carpal tunnel release and send the, the pathology for sampling. Um, so that was all about the AL cardiac amyloid side. Um, the one thing I would say is quite frequently our clinic will send both uh, sides of this workup simultaneously so that we avoid unnecessary delays in, in ordering tests. So it's easier for us just to order everything up front. Uh, we know that a large portion of ATTR patients do have an MGUS, um, and therefore you might end up down this AL pathway spending months doing the workup, and actually it was ATTR. Um, and that's just because a lot of our ATTR patients are older, and MGUS is common in older patients. So at our center, we do do both of these simultaneously. Unfortunately, that means occasionally you run into patients that you think have some combination of both. Uh, but the AL will always take preference because the treatment for the AL is more of an emergency. ATTR is going to take months before it impacts survival. On the ATTR side, you're going to hear from Dr. Akinjalu as well as Dr. Ruddy in terms of the importance of the pyrophosphate scanning. So again, I won't belabor the point too much other than to say really depends where the uptake is. If the uptake is in the heart, then it's a clearly positive study. If the uptake is in the blood pool, then it's a, a negative study. Um, so thanks again for the introduction. And uh, I think there's time for questions, if I'm correct, Gina. Yes, thank you, Dr. Miller. Yes, uh, we have 10 minutes for question and answers, and you can actually enter your questions on chat or, or you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, a any questions about the uh, uh, pathways, how to identify these patients? Uh, obviously, um, five years is a long time before they get diagnosed. Once they start to have symptoms, and then they probably see the family physician, then a GP or an internist, and keep coming back and forth. But it's a long time uh, coming until they get diagnosed. So we would like to uh, reach out to other physicians uh, um, other than cardiologists who sees these patients before they get to see a cardiologist. Um, here's a question from Dr. Ramsa. Any experience with PET amyloid tracers? That's the this next- This is uh... a great question. <laughs> Am I allowed to answer it or do I have to wait sure. for you to give the- I uh, go it's... for it, but I think I'll have Dr. Reddy also um, address it too. Go for it, Rob. Yeah, so I, I think there are PET radio tracers that we think are going to be quite good. And uh, an important difference is with ATTR, we're relying on this non-specific binding of the radio tracer, whereas the PET radio tracers like Evuzamatide are amyloid specific. So we know they bind to a portion of the amyloid fibril. Um, but they're not specific for ATTR. So they're going to bind in any type of amyloid. So there's always probably going to be a role for bone scintigraphy because it's very good at differentiating ATTR from AL amyloid. Um, unfortunately, I don't think anybody in Canada has access to evuzamatide. And the only PET radio tracer I've seen people trial is um, sodium fluoride. Um, there was a study out of uh, one of the Quebec groups where they looked at sodium fluoride uptake in ATTR, and it was not consistent. And uh, any other questions on uh, identifying these patients? Clinical red flags. Well, with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. We will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Sabe Day from Western. Um, Dr. Day is the uh, uh, director of Echocardiography uh, Lab in, in Western, and he's also the fellowship director for adult echocardiography and educational director for the Division of Cardiology. He's originally from Halifax, and uh, then he went to Cleveland Clinic for further training, as well as British Columbia for uh, level three echocardiography. And so... Uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Uh, Sabi Day with us today. <laughs> Thank you. It's all yours. 
Okay, great. Uh, great. Uh, people can hear me okay. Thank you, Cheatham, for uh, the kind introduction and for uh, um, uh, having me participate in this uh, fantastic program you put together today. Uh, really, uh, this is a nice segue uh, from Dr. Miller's talk, uh, but I'm focused a little more on the echo side of things. And I know we have perhaps a general audience, um, and I'm, uh, there will be some echo um details in there, but I want to also try and give you a broader appreciation for things you might look at on an echo report uh, when you're suspecting or wondering if somebody may have a cardiac amyloid. There are some relevant disclosures there with industry uh, and we'll uh, go on. So with respect to amyloid, uh, and I'm uh, I'm talking a little more about TTR amyloid because of the explosion in terms of the imaging as nicely highlighted uh, by Dr. Miller, but the but it does apply uh, to both to some extent. So as we know more and more about TTR amyloid, uh, we do know that it accounts for about 13% of patients that are diagnosed with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. When, as we know, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is just based off an EF of greater than 50% with patients that exhibit clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure, including increased filling pressures. As Dr. Miller showed, uh, a, a proportion of patients undergoing Cavi for severe aortic stenosis, particularly the low flow, low gradient, about 15% of them, especially above the age of 80, uh, will have uh, some TTR amyloid uh, present. Oftentimes, this is a misdiagnosed uh, or underappreciated entity. We're better, and I'll show you where ECHO can help us. And now we've got a whole vast array of multimodality imaging uh, that we can call upon, but about 5% of patients who have presumed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy often, in fact, have, uh, have amyloid. Uh, as was shown and will be discussed by my colleague, Dr. Davey, uh, amyloid, typically TTR amyloid has therapies with a mortality benefit. Uh, timely diagnosis is of the essence, particularly in AL amyloid with the numerous chemotherapeutic agents that are available. And the nice thing about uh, amyloid nowadays is with the multimodality imaging, including echocardiography, and some of the other partners, uh, we can work up a lot of this non-invasively, and they don't always need, if we can clinch a diagnosis of TTR amyloid, uh, this can all often be done without any biopsy. So I'm going to start by uh, just a couple of technical slides in terms of determining left ventricular hypertrophy. And the thickened ventricle is a, a talk I like to do with a lot of my fellows. And on, on, on echocardiography, we'll often use either an M mode uh, uh, where we're, we're putting a cursor through uh, the long axis of the left ventricle and uh, seeing what the dimensions are of the septum and the posterior wall. Now, if you don't do echo, that's okay, but a normal thickness is generally, uh, uh, an abnormal thickness is 11 millimeters or more. And when I start to get concerned about amyloid is when we have unexplained LVH, as was nicely highlighted in the previous talk, 15 millimeters or more on the septum or posterior wall. Um, oftentimes, we'll go through a rigorous assessment where we'll look at entities like the relative wall thickness, the left ventricular mass index, and we'll further characterize the pattern of hypertrophy. Is it concentric? Are both the septum posterior wall equally affected? Is your asymmetric septal hypertrophy you may see with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? There's a number of different nuances to, to LVH that we're going to try to appreciate uh, in echocardiography. Now, this may be a patient with hypertrophic, sorry, with um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And you can see on, even if you don't look at a lot of echo, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, this is the RA, and this is the left atrium. And you can see how big that left atrium is. And you can see that that intraatrial septum is bowing to the right side, suggestive of a very high left atrial pressure. And also that goes along with this, the heart, the ejection fraction is preserved and we see very thickened walls. And this particular type of echo has a is a, has a vast differential and is really important to be able to understand and better delineate what is going on in these patients. And it may include hypertensive heart disease. The patient may have valvular heart disease, easy enough to figure out if we see there's atrial stenosis. Fabry disease, which is now phagalactosidase uh, deficiency that has newer therapies associated with it, as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Both of these disease entities have newer agents that have um, selected um, benefits with them, as well as amyloidosis, which is the one I'm going to be fixated on. This particular patient had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and sometimes it's very hard to differentiate on echo, and we'll need uh, other modalities like, like an MRI uh, to help us out. 
Once again, um, I realize and recognize there may not be many uh, echocardiographers in the audience, but we will do an assessment of diastolic function based on a number of different echo determinants, including an, uh, a tissue Doppler, which gives us early and late um, emptying velocities uh, across the septum, the lateral wall. The tricuspid uh, regurgitation velocity helps us determine our RVSP using uh, the Bernoulli equation, 4B squared. If there's left atrial volume index, left atrial volume index in echocardiography, we call it the hemoglobin A1C of diastolic dysfunction. It's a marker of chronic increased filling pressures. And hemodynamic assessments can help you as well. Something called an E to E prime ratio, that's above 14. We will then move on down a further algorithm. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we want to see the degree of diastolic dysfunction. And diastolic dysfunction traditionally has felt to be the first marker uh, or early marker that we may have a restrictive process in our ventricle and, uh, and, and it may be a marker to go along with cardiac amyloid. So let's um, show you a case. Uh, I'm from Nova Scotia originally. I had uh, spent a few years in community practice before uh, uh, moving here in London in 2016. And this was a patient that I saw my last year community practice in Nova Scotia, came into my office, a 62-year-old lady with HEPPEF. She came in to, uh, with a one-year history of worsened dystonia on exertion. She was NYHA class four. Uh, within the office, she had a third heart sound and the KVP was a, that was at the angle of the jaw. She had other findings of heart flare with bivalves or crackles and two plus peripheral edema. And we do an echocardiogram. This is a peristernal long axis that shows our, our septum and posterior wall. And this is a this is a short axis where we can see um, a number of walls of the left ventricle. And we can see that the septum and the posterior wall are both abnormally thick at 15 millimeters and 16 millimeters respectively. Uh, when we go on to look from a para an apical four chamber, this is the left ventricle here once again, um, we can see that the uh, LV function is very close to normal. There is biatrial enlargement. RV is also looks a little bit hypertrophied with slightly diminished function there. We start looking at our uh, transmitral Doppler assessment for diastolic uh, dysfunction and the tissue Doppler velocity across the medial and lateral uh, annuluses are markedly reduced. These are typically on the order of 9 to 11 uh, on the medial lateral side. And when we see that the, uh, especially the medial E prime, which is that early filling velocity is less than five, uh, then, we, then um, we, we have to suspect that it's something beyond standard hypertensive heart disease. And there, there must be some abnormality in the myocardium. This is a pulmonary vein flow reversal. Usually this is a nice big S wave followed by a D wave. There's S to D uh, um, uh, reversal or uh, or blunting of the S wave. This goes along with significant diastolic dysfunction. And I always like clinical caveats or correlates that go along with uh, LVH. And I'll often look at the ECG if it's available. And here we can see that this is low voltage. So this likely excludes hypertensive heart disease in this patient and makes us very suspicious of cardiac uh, amyloid. And we can see here in this uh, particular patient, this was the initial presentation echo. And one month later, there seems to be a subtle decline in LV systolic function. And we see that those uh, tissue Doppler parameters have now come down. This is the same uh, echo sonographer scanning on the same machine, the same patient. Uh, and you can see that these are um, fairly reproducible numbers, but they've, they've markedly dropped significantly. And this lady was uh, operating down a slippery slope. And interestingly enough, she actually had um, uh, a monoclonal gammopathy going along with ale, uh, cardiac amyloid, and was put promptly on chemotherapy. She was biopsied by uh, some of my friends and colleagues in Halifax, and uh, she was treated uh, appropriately. Now, going back into you know the, the vault, back to 2004, they talk about the speckled or granular appearance of the myocardium, which really is a poor predictor in the contemporary era of potential cardiac amyloid. We can look at things like, is there restrictive inflow there uh, and an absent A wave? So an A wave is uh, that goes along uh, is a late um, diastolic filling wave that, that uh, actually captures atrial mechanical function. So in patients with AFib, we cardiovert them and why do we wait four weeks um, uh, to take off their uh, anticoagulation? It's because typically ECHO has shown us that's when atrial me mechanical function um, will, will, will come back and that atrial kick that accounts for 25% of our cardiac output is there. Now, this is a patient in sinus rhythm who actually has an absent A wave, and this is atrial arrest. And the reason for that is the amyloid is invading the atrium, causing it to be very stiff, such that it can't contract in the mechanical um, function, uh, and it's impeded that, uh, that atrial mechanical function. 
We can see there's a low stroke volume to go along with this off of, off of a Doppler signal across the LVOT and a markedly de depressed uh, E-prime. Uh, we just saw a nice uh, summary of uh, from this doc uh, of um, clinical features of uh, of amyloid, and you can see here that there are there is a disease process where the patient may show us things like bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, bicep tendon rupture. There's going to then start to be an elevation in natriuretic peptides, and on echocardiography, the more and more TTR amyloid deposits. Uh, 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 are present, the more uh, the increase in the degree of diastolic dysfunction, the increase in uh, LV thickness, and the increase in heart failure symptoms will soon soon be there. So we're really, really trying to figure out where we can hit this disease entity um, in a, uh, in an early fashion, an early diagnostic uh, fashion before the patient is uh, has significant heart failure symptoms, which is usually where they pick them up. And uh, my clinical practice is almost. Uh, is is mostly heart fire along with Dr. Davey. And so uh, this is where we often pick up a lot of these patients. Once again, um, we suspect the amyloid based off that nice CJC document when the patient has a number of different signs and symptoms, including neuropathies. But I really want to focus on the unexplained LB wall thickness, things like low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis in a patient with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, so just a few, how else can cardiac amyloid affect uh, um, uh, the ventricle itself or what are some other echo findings? Well, you may often will have a small bystander pericardial effusion. The right ventricle can be thickened. We can see valvular thickening, thickening of the intraatrial septum, a low stroke volume, paradoxical low flow, low gradient. And then we're going to get into abnormalities that suggest restrictive filling. Um, so we'll do a diastolic function assessment, uh, as I showed you uh, before, and we'll look as well at, a, at an entity called global longitudinal strain. I'll talk a little more about that as we go on. So this is a case. This is a 78. This is another case. Uh, this is a 78-year-old gentleman with heart failure symptoms. You can see that the LV function, the LV is quite thick. The septum posterior wall each measures 16 millimeters, uh, respectively. Uh, this is the apical three chamber where we see the infralateral wall and the anterior septum as well as the, uh, the two chamber with the inferior wall and the anterior wall, we can see thickness across the LV. Um, we do a, this is mitral inflow velocity. We see the E, we see an E and an A wave. Uh, this one has a pretty good loop. The tissue Doppler velocities are markedly reduced, less than five each. So this is a real world study. Um, we can see uh, the TR signal, there's not too much pulmonary hypertension in this one. And then we turn towards strain imaging. So strain, what that is, is that that is basically where we're looking at myocardial deformation and it's tracking uh, the pixelation and changes in the pixelation from, from beat to beat. And what happens is we, across the 16 segments, we will then do a strain, uh, a bullseye plot where we can see the apical segments here, the mid segments uh, in the middle zone, as well as uh, the basal segments and the outer um, zone. And we can see here that there's abnormal strain defined as an absolute value. So the more negative uh, the strain value, the more healthier the myocardium, the more normal it is. And uh, anything uh, 20 or uh, higher is considered normal in terms of the absolute number. So we're not confused. And we here we can see that the strain is generally preserved in the apical region. And uh, so we see this apical sparing pattern when we're looking at global longitudinal strain. And you can see here, um, this is a case series uh, from, a, from a Dermont uh, Phelan from Cleveland Clinic. And you can see from A1 to A4, this represents cardiac amyloidosis. And all of these patients demonstrated this apical sparing pattern here. And uh, there are some issues with this. It can uh, often be... Uh, sometimes uh, there are some technical factors in terms of foreshortening and tracing of your region of interest that can uh, contribute to apical sparing. But this pattern of the apex being relatively preserved is very different from other causes of, of left ventricular hypertrophy. B1 to B2, we can see our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And uh, C1 and C2 are and where you can see that the septum is largely affected. The area of hypertrophy has the lowest uh, degree of strain. And C1, C2, we have aortic stenosis, which is more of a homogeneous pattern of decreased strain across all segments. Um, so this is a one way that we can uh, figure this out. And we can see also here, apical HCM was reversed. 
apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the strain is actually reduced at the apex where it is spared in cardiac amyloidosis. And we can see a septal MI going along with the wall motion abnormality. That septal region has a decrease in strain. Here's an interesting way. Uh, this is a case that we had with a 65-year-old with normal thickness, normal ejection fraction. And, and the cl clinical question on the echo rec was, this patient was recently diagnosed with myelo um, um, myeloma and AL amyloid. Is there a cardiac involvement? And we did a strain analysis here on this patient, and there was apical sparing. And you can even go further, and the, there's been a, some published literature in terms of looking at this relapse score. We take the average uh, apical longitudinal strain divided by the sum of the average basal and mid longitudinal strain. If that ratio is above 1.5 to 2, it's very suggestive of possible cardiac amyloid, and it clearly was in this patient. And this patient actually did have cardiac involvement despite a normal thickness. You can have normal thickness LB in about 15% um, of patients who do have cardiac amyloid. And uh, those and and this patient actually um, uh, expired a few months after their echocardiogram was performed. Um, uh, I don't want to give a full lecture on uh, echocardiography, but I do like showing uh, this is another case as a patient with aortic stenosis, and the peak velocity is less than four meters per second, which is not in the severe range, but the aortic valve area comes out less than one, which is severe, and the stroke volume index is markedly reduced. So there are three types of aortic stenosis. One is when you, all of them involve a valve area of less than one. When we have high gradients and uh, peak velocity of above four, mean gradient above uh, above 40, and if the ejection fraction is normal, we've got D1. Uh, it's severe symptomat symptomatic, severe high gradient aortic stenosis. If the EF is less than 50, we've got a valve area that's less than one, but those gradients aren't quite as high as we would like, then, then we have a, a symptomatic severe low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with reduced EF to and a dobutamine stress cycle. But D3, which is the paradoxical low flow, low gradient, the EF is preserved. We have a low valve area less than one, and, the, and we have a, a peak velocity of less than four and a stroke volume index of less than 35. These are the patients that we have to really look at. And there's this nice uh, case series of looking at cardiac amyloidosis and its predictors in elderly patients. They looked at a number of patients at Columbia University um, uh, who were undergoing uh, TAVI. And you can see here that um, you know they looked at uh, the patient's uh, characteristics. But the meat of this is that of all patients, 16% of them actually had TTR amyloidosis. And uh, a lot of, you can see here, um, some of the clinical electrocardiographic and echocardiographic findings in these patients, oftentimes they tend to be more male in gender. Uh, they may have a low systolic pressure, high BNP. They could have conduction abnormalities on their ECG, uh, large left atrial, uh, left atrial enlargement, low flow, low gradient, a um, number of different things. The ejection fraction might be a little bit reduced in the mid-range, 40 to 50%. These are all clues that somebody with aortic stenosis may, uh, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis may have con uh, concurrent TTR. And oftentimes when they see that pattern, our TAVI team will often order a, um, a technetium pyrophosphate scan and ask for some guidance. That was like showing... Uh, you know, some of the uh, interesting ca cases. This was a patient uh, that myself and Dr. Davey were involved in. He was a 42-year-old male with familial TTR cardiac amyloidosis diagnosed in 2010. He had the associated mutation as described. He had an EF of 35% with biventricular hypertrophy, significant diastolic dysfunction, and he had biatrial enlargement. Here you can see that uh, thickened uh, septum and posterior wall they were about 15 millimeters a piece, the ejection fraction of 35%, some left atrial enlargement as well. And when we look at this, some real nuanced echo findings, once again, like I said, we see we have significantly reduced um, uh, uh, tissue Doppler uh, uh, velocities of less than five. And we see that in sinus rhythm, this is an E wave, but there's no A wave to go along. Uh, this patient had an acute ischemic stroke in January of 2019 with a neurological deficit and right-sided weakness. He was diagnosed with a left MCA infarction, underwent endovascular treatment with mechanical thrombectomy. Here we can see the actual stroke. And when you look at the workup, he had a 12 lead ECG that had sinus rhythm. Two weeks of continuous cardiac monitoring showed some atrial ectopy, but no atrial fibrillation whatsoever. Eight years of study ECGs, never atrial fibrillation de detected. He had an extensive workup imaging of the head, neck, and lower limb vasculature with no source of embolism. 
and a TT that showed a PFO, uh, PFO. Neurology had thought that this may be a paradoxical emboli just because of the PFO, uh, and uh, were ready to dis, uh, and they basically discharged them home. Uh, knowing this patient myself and a little bit about this nuance on the uh, uh, the atrial arrest, I'd pushed for a TEE. They did not get done as an inpatient. He was discharged before time, but we did get this TEE done. We did actually, you can look at left atrial strain as well, and this is markedly reduced at 7.7. .7. And we can see here that on TEE, which is what we order for patients with stroke, this is a left atrial appendage. This is often where clots for atrial fibrillation sit. And you can see there's significant clot burden here in this patient who's clearly in sinus rhythm. I'll repeat TEE. We anticoagulated the gentleman for six weeks with a pixaban, brought back for TEE, and there's still a clot, and the anticoagulation strategy was changed to the warfarin. So there's been a newer um, burst of literature showing that patients who have uh, amyloidosis are at very high risk of thromboembolism and embolic events, and at any time, uh, cardioversion should never, ever uh, occur without a TEE performed. And you can see here, this patient never had AFib, but despite that, because of the loss of atrial mechanical function, had significant clot uh, noted. And uh, this was, uh, you know, we actually ended up writing up this patient. Interestingly enough, we had tried to take the patient uh, through uh, a workup for heart and liver transplantation. Um, and the patient uh, did not wish to proceed further because in the pandemic, uh, he did not wish uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and this was um, this and a few other issues. Unfortunately, uh, he did he did not uh, wish to undergo tr a transplant workup and uh, and uh, passed away uh, in the last uh, few years. So just to kind of wrap this up um, and, and I'm going to address this. So let's just talk about nuances. If you are somebody that's dealing with a lot of echocardiography, Looking at the pattern of LVH and a septal thickness of 14 millimeters or higher with low voltage on the ECG is a really good combination in terms of trying to pin down amyloidosis. Uh, in terms of all of the echocardiographic findings, I like the medial prime less than four. They actually have a rule of fives uh, for a tissue Doppler. If you're S wave, your medial E prime and your lateral E prime. Uh, sorry, your your um, your medial uh, your E prime and your late a prime are all less than five. We see this in uh, centimeters per second. This is often a pattern we see in late amyloidosis. Um, RVH can be there. Uh, normally, I put a reduced stroke volume index. Um, and consider doing a strain analysis if you have unexplained LVH. Amyloid is a fascinating disease on echocardiography. It can present in a number of ways. You can have a false positive stress echocardiogram because of microvascular dysfunction. Um, it really just... It, it, once you consider the diagnosis, though, there are other ways. The echo is a very easy, uh, accessible, and attainable test with no radiation to the patient. And from there, you can go further. Amyloid gets missed all the time. Uh, and we have pay, uh, There have been patients that have been transplanted with amyloid hearts because the echocardiogram was not uh, looked at with enough rigor um, or assessment. Uh, so for yourself, if you're ordering an echocardiogram, uh, just make sure that, uh, you know, uh, there's trust in the folks that are interpreting the echocardiogram. I don't say that with any disrespect, but echo labs are just rampant within our, our province. Um, and look for things like if you're, if even if you're not a cardiologist, not an echocardiographer, look to see if there is significant thickness. This is, if the septum posterior wall are more than 15 millimeters on the um, transverse echocardiogram, if there's reported diastolic dysfunction, if the left atrium is big, there's low voltage on your ECG, then maybe look further. And I'm looking forward to some of the talks that talk about how we clinch this diagnosis a little bit better with nuclear imaging and some of the other modalities and how we go on to treat uh, these entities as well in the upcoming talks. And you can see from the heart failure guidelines, a diagnostic workup is um, uh, for cardiac amyloidosis who have signs and symptoms of heart failure, including all the following that had been discussed uh, before, including Increased LV wall thickness, which I hope you have a better appreciation for, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, uh, neuropathy, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, etc. So, uh, in summary, echocardiography is a very useful starting test for the diagnosis of amyloid. Early diagnosis may be helpful in terms of targeting newer therapies. And the red flags really include unexplained LVH out of keeping 
with uh, standard hypertensive heart disease, reduced deep parabola stroke volume, and we can also consider strain imaging as well. So any questions? And with that, I thank you for tuning in today. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, Cheatham, the organizers, as well as the other speakers uh, that are uh, involved. And I do see a hand raised, so I'm happy to take any questions. Go ahead. Hello there. Uh, thank you for this really great presentation. Uh, I want I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, from your experience, do you have, what's the percentage of people who are having uh, a thrombus in their uh, intracardiac thrombus uh, in, in patients with AL and non-AL amyloidosis? And is there any, uh, like, I know that if they have a FIB, of course, um, the, 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 the incidence might be more, but, uh, and what's your recommendation in terms of anticoagulation in those patients also? You know, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I'll tell you that for sinus rhythm, the embolic complications are fairly common late in the disease. Uh, it can occur in up to 30 to 40% of patients with no documented atrial fibrillation, just from the, uh, just similar to the case that I demonstrated with you. In terms of the difference between AL and TTR in terms of thrombotic potential, I can't give you that number offhand. Uh, it has been equally described. It has been described in both entities. And in terms of an anticoagulation strategy, I can tell you that most, uh, a lot of it's, it's kind of user dependent. There's no right or wrong answer. In our particular patient on a good dose of DOAC, and we have good clin farm here. I mean, we could have done anti, you know, we could have done uh, pixaban levels, et cetera, but at five BID with ongoing thrombus, in a man who'd stroked, uh, just went to warfarin and tried to go with a little bit of a higher INR on, on, on them. So I think it really depends. Not all animals are created equal, but I think you have to keep it in, in the back of your head. Uh, if, if the patient has any kind of embolic episode, I think that uh, doing a TE and looking a little bit more closely is very, very important. And like I said, studies have shown patients with AFib uh, who are, who uh, amyloid patients with AFib um, who are adequately anticoagulated, still a, a high percentage of them will still have evidence of residual thrombus. Uh, Dr. Reddy. Dr. Reddy? Hi there, so I mean, great Hi. cases. I think the anticoagulation is underappreciated, the need for that. What I want to talk about is how do you follow these patients? Like if someone who's got the disease, TTR, on treatment, you can follow BMP, which is okay. It doesn't change that much. So echo must have a role. And if you do echo, how often do you do it? What do you look for? No, that's a great, that's a really great question, Dr. Roddy. I can just tell you that, um, you know, um, here in our center, and I can certainly allow Ryan, because he's a director of the clinic, uh, to, uh, to weigh in. But echocardiography is probably done at least every six to 12 months. Once you clinch a diagnosis of uh, amyloid, um, I think that if you see big changes, I, my own experience and even the ones from the trials, uh, the test retest uh, um, uh, kind of uh, accuracy of LVH on an echo or septal posterior wall thickness is all over the map. And technically, you know, and even in a lot of the trials, they haven't shown a significance towards a regression of LVH, especially in a process that's constantly depositing. I go more by how the patient is doing, big changes in LV function. Um, as we know from a heart failure standpoint, these patients don't don't tolerate standard GDMT, especially if there's autonomic uh, dysregulation. They don't tolerate ACEs or beta blockers. Um, but I think uh, typically speaking, uh, it goes by, generally speaking, I, I, I like to see how the patient is doing clinically making sure that their filling pressures are normal, they're not having uh, symptomatic heart failure, they're not wet all the time. And, and I generally look for big picture things on the echo uh, because it's real nuances that we don't really have there. Um, you know, in, in terms of the incorporation of strain into protocols, it's there, but like a lot of labs in Canada, it's not prime time and being done on everyone. I do think as a lab director here, uh, we definitely try and do it on cardiac amyloid where we where we can. Typically, changes in strain should precede changes in 
yeah, drops in uh, in EF. But even as we know, when you've got an, e an EF that's generally preserved, trying to detect a very subtle drop in that is not very easy to do on echocardiography. There can be changes in the cardio in the cardio oncology literature of five to ten percent on any given echo sequentially, even at the same institution. I tend to like big big picture things in terms of following them. And I, 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 I think echo to me is a good gateway to diagnosis. I think in follow-up, I actually like simple things. Looking at the IBC, is it juicy and plethoric? Could the patient be wet? Did the diastolic function worsen? Is there a drop in EF? I find trying to detect changes in, in um, septum poster wall thickness as a treatment target, just being honest, it's a very hard thing to track. That's my own experience. And um, I don't know if anyone else wants to wants to weigh in, Rob, or uh, if Rob or Ryan are on the call in terms of uh, how they use echo in the, in the treatment. But those are some of my thoughts. See, the issue is not everyone responds. Probably 20, 30 percent don't respond. It's a very expensive drug. It'd be, it'd be very desirable to have a way to say, yes, you're responding or even you're not getting worse. Yeah. So BMP can be used. Uh, nuclear has been used a bit, but nuclear response is quite variable too. Patients will get better symptomatically with no change in their PYP scan. Yeah. Cardiac MR has been used for ECV, and ECV tends to improve with mm. treatment. Um, so I was thinking like diastolic dysfunction should improve with treatment. Yeah, I'm thinking global longitudinal strain. There have been some papers showing uh, that when you look at global longitudinal strain, forget the apical sparing pattern, but just what the rest of the ventricle is doing, uh, it should improve. You're not going to see it in you know big big changes like in the septal posterior wall thickness, but there have been some papers that show it does improve in in the responders. Uh, you, you know, um, I don't know how robust that that uh, that 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 literature bank is, but there are some papers that do demonstrate that. Yeah, that would be good. So say you had a patient that, that was not getting better. Uh, the echo parameter did not improve. No. Uh, perhaps he was co-paying for the uh, therapy, so it was costing him two or 3000 um, Stopping the, the medication might be reasonable. No, I, I agree. And the thing with global longitudinal strain, it used to take us like, you know, offline doing this for like five, 10 minutes. And now the machines are so good. Uh, there's auto strain, what pretty much does it, tracks it, you know, immediately. The sonographer spends an extra minute on just, just some uh, high frame rate images at the end of the study, it'll detect it immediately and uh, spit out the number. And it's fairly reproducible too. Um, and all our machines, you know, at our particular lab happen to be, uh, you know, Epic machines uh, by Philips. And this auto strain software is, is really, uh, really quite, um, uh, it, it makes it a lot easier uh, to do. In a, it's not a big, we're always thinking about number of studies, you know, the, it's just a real world thing that we have in all echo labs in Canada in terms of, uh, you know, the scan time and trying to get to the next patient and because so many people need echocardiography, but that's something that is in a select population like this that is a lot easier to do. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Uh, Great question. Thank you, Dr. D. Um yeah, it's it's uh, excellent questions with interaction. Um, so I believe uh, we're done, uh, and we will move on to the next session, and we'll talk about uh, part of the matter nuclear a little bit. Um, so I will share my slides. And so today, uh, I'm joined by Dr. Ruddy. Uh, uh, it's a privilege to have him as a co co speaker with me today. Um, Dr. Ruddy is the uh, director of nuclear cardiology. Well, he was the former director of the nuclear cardiology in in University of Ottawa Heart Institute, and um, he is a clinician scientist and an international leader in cardiovascular nuclear medicine. He has pioneered the technique of measurement of myocardial blood flow on SPECT, CZT SPECT uh, perfusion imaging. However, he is also a leader in uh, cardiac amyloidosis imaging. He has mentored um, hundreds of uh, physicians over the years. And uh, most recently, he has received a master designation from the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. So uh, 
I would like to call him Master Ruddy, and I would be the Jedi in training, if you may. And so uh, I'm an nuclear medicine physician in the University of Western Ontario. Um, and I'm just uh, very honored to be here with excellent speakers and uh, be co-speaker with Dr. Ruddy. We will talk about when to refer and how to interpret uh, hydrophosphate images. And uh, we'll talk about imaging guidelines and some case examples. So here are our disclosures. Um, and one thing to mention is uh, this educational session spinned off of uh, two initiatives. Uh, one of them is the CAPER, the Canadian um, Cardiac Amyloidosis Pyrophosphate Imaging Registry, uh, which uh, six, uh, six uh, institutions across Canada came together and we started uh, to explore the Canadian landscape for cardiac amyloidosis. And uh, as a sister project, we talked about uh, actually how to improve quality of, of pyrophosphate scanning across Canada. And we started uh, as a pilot uh, in Ontario. And so this is the second of the uh, webinars we have been holding uh, to actually do the community outreach, uh, outreach of uh, non-imaging physicians and trainees who, who again, um, see these patients. Um, so now I'm actually happy to see uh, that we have attendees from across the world, uh, from all, all the world, from uh, Saudi. Um, so with this, um, here are the objectives of, of this session. We have seen the recommendations um, from the Canadian Society um, for cardiac amyloidosis, unexplained increased LV wall thickness, older than 60 years of age with low flow, low gradient AS with EF greater than 40%, unexplained peripheral sensory motor neuropathy and or dysautonomia, history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome and established AL or TTR amyloidosis. These, these are the uh, criteria where actually um, it's recommended to do further um, investigation uh, with scintigraphy, of course, after exclusion of AL. Um, I would like to add a few things for patients, who, people who have known hereditary amyloidosis who are actually asymptomatic. Uh, they could be TTR gene carriers. Uh, doing a pyrophosphate scan in these uh, p uh, population is also appropriate. Um, again, we talked about uh, importance of early diagnosis and actually the timelines uh, before they become symptomatic and actually benefit from treatment. So for gene carriers, it is, it is uh, appropriate to um, image these patients on a regular basis. Um, for nuclear guidelines, um, there are procedure imaging guidelines that, is, that, that are developed by uh, American Society of Nuclear Cardiology as well as Canadian Association of Nuclear Medicine. And um, uh, for the uh, um, imaging um, physicians in the in the audience, uh, basically, is is a is a regular technetium pyrophosphate injection is a bone seeking agent, a ten to twenty millicury. We tend to use more between fifteen and twenty, and um, the guidelines started as uh, as one hour for planar, and then three hours delayed planar, as well as spect or spec CT. Uh, when available. Um, recently, most of the centers I have spoken with, including ours, uh, we have moved to just uh, one-time delayed imaging for these patients because of the blood pool activity on one-hour images. Um, there is no patient preparation needed, uh, no fasting required. That's the other uh, beauty of the scan. Um, the spec parameters are, again, uh, standard for, for um, a dual head camera. Um, and we do acquire some of these patients on our CZT cameras as well. We do have a 16 slice CT um, in, in our department, which we are able to perform low dose attenuation correction and anatomic mapping. And so the qualitative visual scoring is basically from grade zero to three, where grade zero is, is a no uptake uh, above blood pool when you compare to the contralateral ratio from heart to contralateral. And then as, as you start to see 
uh, various degrees of uptake, it goes to one, two, and three. Um, we do do SPECT grading and we compare the myocardial uptake to the adjacent rib uptake. And when it's uh, equal to rib uptake, it's usually grade two. When it's greater than rib uptake, it's grade three. Um, we are also moving away from actually um, uh, doing the heart to contractor ratios in terms of numbers uh, for planar images. And we will show it uh, with cases and, um, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be able to get the message across uh, the importance of 3D imaging. Um, so in terms of radiation exposure, I mean, knowing that these people are usually older population, nonetheless, uh, we still have to use the uh, approach ELARA as low as reasonably achievable. And the total body effective dose from the scan is about three millisieverts. And the low dose CT will add approximately two millisieverts. And actually our current CT with the smart CT protocol, we, we give uh, um, around one millisievert in addition. Um, so for the guidelines, when we continue on the SPECT and SPECT CT images, as you can see, um, two dimensional versus three dimensional images, how, how well the anatomic mapping helps to localize the um, activity in the myocardium. And these are just the ratios where we draw two circles, one over the left and one over the right um, lower hemithorax, and we do a ratio. When, when the ratio is 1.5 or greater than 1.5, um, then the study was considered positive but uh, more recently, the studies have shown that actually um, in ratios between 1 and 1.5, where they were previously considered equivocal, um, we can easily localize the activity within the myocardium, and those patients are actually considered positive instead of equivocal. Uh, or when you can localize the activity within the pool, you can again consider these patients uh, negative. This is the advantage of three-dimensional imaging. So um, in summary, the planar images allows a visual assessment and planar quantification. It does not require, uh, it does not define regional differences, uh, myocardial versus blood pool activity. Um, the planar imaging does not account for tracer uptake unrelated to amyloidosis, such as calcified valves, um, mitral endos calcification, calcified thrombus or pericardial calcification in some cases, and may be impacted by tracer uptake in the skeleton and blood pool activity. On the other hand, SPECT imaging, particularly with CT attenuation correction and anatomic mapping, overcomes these limitations. So we can determine the exact localization of tracer uptake, and uh, we can also, SPECT CT images particularly, allow a more quantitative tracer uptake evaluation by the um, generation of polar maps or of raw counts and the determination of a relative tracer intensity. So here's a case example, a 81-year-old male with hypersophic cardiomyopathy and asymmetrical septal hypertrophy and few other red, uh, red flags in the clinical. Um, and, and here's the planar image of this patient. And, and uh, when we draw the region of interest on both sides, while we do not get the expected ratio of 1.5, equal to 1.5 or greater. Um, so it's just the ratio is one. And then we do the SPECT images. We don't see much here. Um, we can actually determine that it's the blood pool. And in order to increase our confidence, you can easily see here, the activity is exactly in the blood pool. You can actually differentiate the um, myocardial wall here versus the blood pool activity on the SPECT CT images. So this is an easily negative pyrophosphate scan. But of course, not all planars are equal as we're em emphasizing the importance of three-dimensional imaging. So these are two different patients with the same heart to control lateral ratio of 1.4. So if you don't have SPECT images, you would just say, yes, you know, both of these patients are equivocal. Um, However, when we do the three-dimensional imaging, so one patient um, clearly shows uptake in the myocardial wall. You can actually identify the left ventricular myocardium. And the other patient, again, 
you can clearly then see the blood pool activity. If you're in doubt, again, when you have the SPECS CT images, you can see 1.4 in the heart to contralateral ratio, one patient is clearly showing a positive scan and the other patient's clearly negative. So we don't really get stuck on numbers anymore. We do three-dimensional imaging with anatomic mapping. And uh, actually we were able to eliminate lots of equivocal scans with, with this approach. So Canadian guidelines also actually um, emphasize the importance of SPEC CT. And they suggest that we report this study as a normal or abnormal, meaning positive pyrophosphate scan or negative pyrophosphate scan, and always recommend additional evaluation as appropriate, which we mean by this is the light chain assessment. You have to rule out AL. Um, so in summary, um, SPECT is better than planar. SPECT CT is better than SPECT. Here's a patient, again, um, with a low-grade diffuse uptake, as you can see. Um, within the myocardium, the heart to contralateral ratio is, is below 1.5. However, um, you can see the uptake um, in the myocardium on the SPEC CT. And again, you can only say that this is TTR if you exclude the light chain presence. If, if the patient indeed has light chains in the serum or urine, then you have to actually consider this as an AL. Uh, the important thing with the low-grade uptake is it could be an early TTR or it could be AL. That, that's why uh, the light chain analysis is a must. So the TTR amyloidosis can reliably be diagnosed without biopsy um, in the follow when the following criteria are met, and all of them, not just one or two or three. The heart failure, echo or MR consistent with or suggestive of amyloidosis, grade two or three uptake on the radionuclide scan, and I should emphasize on the 3D imaging, on the SPECT scan, and the absence of detectable monoclonal protein. So histological confirmation and typing, of course, should be sought in cases in which these criteria are not met. So SPEC CT emphasize when available uh, because it can differentiate between blood pool and the myocardium. And it's important where the counts are coming from. They can be coming from blood pool or different structures in the, in the chest. As you can see, this patient has bilateral pleural effusions, some partial probably um, co collapse of the uh, lower, uh, lower lobes. Or it could be that the Heart could be shifted, actually, left ventricle could be shifted to a, uh, because of the, here you can see severe enlargement of the right atrium. And this patient also happens to have a um, left-sided rib fracture that uh, takes up pyrophosphate, which is a bone-seeking agent anyways. And again, you can see uh, there's various patterns observed on SPEC CT. It could be a focal uptake, could be a diffuse uptake. We could see focal on diffuse uptake with the septal prominence. We could see low-grade diffuse uptake. Um, when you can see the apical sparing in some cases, like apex would be negative um, with no pyrophosphate uptake, even though the remainder of the segments show significant um, uptake. So um, I believe this is where I start asking my master. <laughs> Here's a case. 74-year-old um, male patient with hypertension, multivessel disease. He has known CAD. Uh, EF is 40%, has a history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Apparently, some things don't make sense in this patient. So he's, um, he's further referred for pyrophosphate scan. So, uh, Dr. Reddy? So looking at the planers, it looks like the uptake is similar on both sides of the sternum. On the other hand, the sternum looks a little bit brighter than usual. So in terms of if you're to calc the, calculate a ratio between the, uh, the heart side versus the contralateral lung, it most likely would be normal. You yes, really and expect in, images. I think indeed. The, the, world, the way the academic world is going is dropping planar and doing spec CT. Yeah, it's, it's the 2D versus 3D because you just see, you know, 
it's almost like you only see one side of the story, one perspective. You don't have you, the full. And it's I'm confusing for yeah. trainees and uh, individuals that don't read a lot of these scans. So if we were to just do planar imaging, this would be read as a negative scan, but some things again, don't make sense. Um, exactly, so, so it's he, a sterile uptake that doesn't make sense. Yes, so here's the three-dimensional spec images of the same patient. Yeah. Uh, my pointer doesn't work. So, oh. uh, so you could uh, do, point Do you see the, my pointer? Yeah, it works very nice. Okay. So okay. that's septal uptake, and the septal uptake goes anteroceptally and also introceptally. So that's abnormal. That's your first observation, abnormal PYP uptake. This could be uh, cardiac amyloid. It could also be coronary disease. This could be an infarct. So you'd want to know other data, which would be ECG or echo. If the wall motion was normal in that area, that would be quite helpful. If the ECG was normal, that'd also be quite helpful. It would point you strongly towards TTR, Emily. Yeah, the, the patient has multivessel disease but has no history of infarct. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting to see actually the one we, the area we thought was sternum, the sternum doesn't even have much uptake. The, the septum is just behind the sternum, but uh, sternal area does not even show a bone uptake. Exactly. That's because of the overlap of tissues on planar, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And uh, here's the spec CT images of the patient. And here you can see um, an, a very nice overlap of, of spec and CT images mm -hmm. where this patient has just a, a significant um, focal uptake of the pyrophosphate scan. So this would be this would be read as a positive scan. But again, um, you could only say it's suggestive of TTR once the light chains are excluded. You'd grade it two. Would you grade it three? You know, looking at the ribs, I would grade it at three. Exactly. Like the septum is higher than the ribs, right? Okay. So, so this is where we're at um, with the pyrophosphate scanning. So now um, knowing the importance of three-dimensional imaging and also uh, uh, having spec CT uh, as a uh, roadmap, uh, we are now uh, doing serial images for these patients to assess treatment response. But as, as uh, both you and Sabe mentioned, um, and maybe Ryan will talk about it too, um, these are just new studies we don't know yet um, because the mechanism for pyrophosphate uh, accumulation in the myocardium uh, in patients with the TTR amyloid is still somewhat unknown. It's not, uh, it's not clearly defined. And so we're, we're, uh, we're just checking to see if we'll see regression and, and what would that actually, what would that mean in these patients? Um, so... We're trying to quantify and see if uh, there's treatment uh, response and if we can assess it with pyrophosphate scans. And so the, the ongoing case examples are from Ottawa Heart Institute. I'll, I'll have Dr. Roddy take all over. Sure. These cases were supplied by Dr. Mel Silicon Gulash, who works with me. She's a, a research associate, associate coordinating our PYP and blood flow studies. Um, so it's a, a very interesting case, 76-year-old man with dyspnea, so it was symptomatic. He had atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease. So many patients like this, typically some hypertension, some volume overload. Then on echo, he had severe LVH. So you'd expect LVH in this patient, probably not severe. And then on, on echo, he also had uh, apical sparing. So that's another pointer towards amyloid, a TTR amyloid. So our imaging, we typically do at 2.5 hours. So anywhere between two and three hours in for 2.5 hours. So we eliminate blood pool as much as possible and only have to image once. So um, I think most centers are moving away from two time points. Uh, yeah. we, we do do uh, two hour imaging, but um, 
um, sometimes we delay and spec CT always is done after the planar. Actually, again, it's a, it's a matter of probably time where we will abandon the planar images, but for now we're, we're keeping them. Yeah, there are case reports of studies that are positive at one hour and negative at three hour that have mild and moderate uptake and related to the decay of the technetium. So uh, there is a little concern. So I think uh, 2.5 might be pushing it. Two, the number you've chosen is probably a, a good time point. Um, guidelines still haven't gone that way, though. One hour yeah, is still we're, at a time. Yeah, we're trying to balance the blood pool and the myocardial uptake. Um, I know in the States, when there was a, a shortage of pyrophosphate, they switched to uh, DPD. Um, and now they're doing actually just one hour because the way it works is one hour images are much better than uh, pyrophosphate one hour images. So if, if you do pyrophosphate delayed, it's better. With the uh, DPD, it's uh, um, earlier is better. So yeah, it's exactly interesting. Right. There's a uh, faster blood pool clearance, so you'd expect less blood pool at one hour. The problem is you also get tissue uptake with DVD. So the tissue uptake can be superimposed on the myocardial uptake. And you see that on the planar for sure. And it may affect the quantitation uh, on spec, um, depending upon how you normalize your data. Yeah, our pyrophosphate comes from Calgary. I think we're good in Canada for that. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. Mm -hmm. I'll present the history and you can interpret. Okay. 49-year-old male, known uh, coronary artery disease, had a routine echo related to his coronary artery disease follow-up, and it showed mild concentric LVH, but he had severe biatrial dilation. That's something you, you associate more with amyloid. Um, so he had routine imaging 2.5 hours. His ratio was 1.1. Yeah, it's interesting because we rarely see this age group um, on our uh, pyrophosphate list. They're usually elderly, like you know, I guess over 60 years of age. Uh, we have done early, younger patients, but uh, some of them, actually, most of them have uh, family history. Um, but still, uh, of course, suspecting is uh, one thing. Uh, and so, in the uh, planar images. Um, I see a silhouette um, of activity on the left side, uh, but I believe that when you do the ratio, it will be well below 1.5. Uh, on the spec, I do see uh, I do see some accumulation on the left hemithorax, but on the spec CT, I'm confident that this is blood pool. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of thoughts. On uh, a negative study, uh, you have very little counts. And that's what makes them hard to interpret. So we always take the upper limit and lower it as much as we can, which is good. That allows us to see blood pool. I think you can see blood pool here. Maybe you could point that out. See, my pointer doesn't work. You see the LV blood pool? Yes. So we yeah. can see the LV blood pool right yeah. here. <laughs> and then you see the big right atrium here, right exactly. ventricle. Yeah. You see RV blood pool too, where you had the pointer. You also see scatter from the sternum. Yes. And yeah, sometimes that's right, yeah. a problem for reading. Some readers want to call that RV uptake, but the, mm -hmm. the truth is no, this would be scatter from the sternum because we set our upper limit so low. That's right. And I think part of it is also uh, the the color scale. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we use slightly different um, mm -hmm. Exponential color scale, yes. um, which which also helps. I don't think you can change that though. Oh, my uh, AirPods are giving issues. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So we move. We moved on to the next case. Okay. I just want to go back to the previous case. Okay, can can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you well. Okay. Uh, um, I just wanted to comment, no, uh, stay okay. with the word. Yes. So point out the scatter from the sternum. Yes, right here. 
Yeah, and that's good to see. That tells you you've reduced your upper limits low enough mm -hmm. that if there was any myocardial activity, you should see it in the myocardial areas. And you don't. So that increases your, your certainty. This is truly a negative. Yes. Yes, the, it, it, it's really adjacent to the right ventricle. Yes, that's true, yeah. too. Yeah, I agree. Sorry about my AirPods. Oh, yeah, they're fine. Okay. So here. So 85-year-old male, shortness of breath. Um, we have cardiologists refer to cardiac MR as, a, as an early test. That's what this patient received. So very minimal hypertrophy, but his ECVU is high, 49%, and he has oh. a diffuse gadolinium. So that's consistent with an infiltrative cardiomyopathy, which led to this study. Yes, yeah, so septum, as, as Sabe mentioned, it is, it is 13 minutes, it is thick, um, and EF is high, so this is a, a, you know, definitely a preserved EF. Um, MRI is abnormal, so you have two two of four parameters to suspect. And, and now you can see how the uh, on the planar images, there's a prominent uptake. It, this is at least grade two over here, but on spec, it looks like uh, more like grade three uptake. Mm -hmm. um, and on the spec CT, I can clearly see the activity. Most of it is localized in the septum. And uh, there's also low grade uptake in the lateral wall as well. Um, so uh, again, the, these are uh, almost all the criteria are met. I don't know the light chain uh, analysis, but uh, three out of the four criteria is there. Yeah, the light, uh, light chain was negative. The biggest um, okay. RV uptake. Uh, right ventricular uptake. Actually, I wouldn't call this probably scattered because it's a bit too uh, deep. So I would expect sternal scatter a bit more over here. So there is actually, I would say, probably low-grade RV uptake as well. Exactly. And that's been shown to be prognostically important. So if you look at the LV uptake, it's really just in the septum, so be focal on diffuse. Probably not that severe. That goes with the ZF being normal. Um, also goes with diffuse LGE. The RV, on the other hand, would suggest uh, a poor prognosis. And here's the 85 year old female. Um, so shall I read it? Yeah. So yeah. this patient has severe concentric LVH. Now septum is 15 millimeters. EF is preserved. And uh, <clears throat> there's apical sparing on the uh, long longitudinal strain is 10.5% with apical sparing. Severe by atrial dilation, right ventricular uh, pressure is 50, is high. And uh, the ratio is <clears throat> borderline, I would say, um, um, but this is a two and a half hour imaging, so actually it's high for two and a half hours. Remember the uh, Canadian guidelines ratios, that is 1.5 cutoff is for one hour imaging. Um, as you delay the imaging, the, the ratio goes, the, the threshold goes down, that is 1.3. Um, yeah. So again, in this patient, I can see, I can make out that this, a silhouette of the myocardial wall at the left ventricle. So this would be a low-grade diffuse uptake. Mm -hmm. And is it low grade? Um, I mean, your filter is a little different than our center. So uh, it's yeah. too smooth. Yeah. Um, probably grade two. Yourself. Is yeah. it grade two or, two or, or three. maybe three? Yeah. 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 Our filter is a little sharper, but nonetheless, you can still uh, identify the myocardial silhouette, which is the most important thing on the pyrophosphate scan. And the question is blood pool versus myocardium. So it's myocardium. Yeah. Yeah. And you're exactly right. That's the big call. The big decision is it LV or blood pool? And it clearly is LV. But then you have to check off other things. You go to the CT, the spec CT. Um, what's happening um, on the lateral aspect? Um, I can see a spot of calcium right here. And then there's also probably a fusion. Exactly. Um, the is there pericardial, pericardial effusion? And on the other side, I think it's a pericardial effusion too. 
Yes, just right over here. Uh, but nonetheless, I think still uh, there's a atrial dilation as well, um, plus yeah. effusion. There's probably some atrial blood pool as well. Yes, and that actually um, you can see the blood pooling because uh, when there's atrial dilation, you will see more blood pooling. But it's a good thing that the left ventricle is still um, identifiable with the blood pool versus myocardium. Yeah, and you do see blood pool at two and a half hours in people who have severe biatrial dilation. Typically, they have no atrial contraction, so the mm -hmm. blood pool just sits there. Uh, Even when you wait. Yeah. Yeah, so it's probably atrial blood flow with pericardial effusions. So we call that at least grade two and probably grade three. And here's a 71 year old male patient with LV hypertrophy. And incidentally, detect. Oh, this is interesting for mortgage insurance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, well, do they do cardiac tests for mortgage insurance? Oh, he had an ECG, and the ECG showed oh. LVH. So he was totally asymptomatic, and it's the ECG that, that led to this. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so, and obviously the MRI was abnormal with diffuse uh, enhancement, um, subendocardial to transmural. Mm -hmm. And the pyrophosphate scan, even the planar, looks very abnormal. Um, and here I can see on the spec CT, this, this I would call focal on diffuse. So there's diffuse uptake, but there's septal prominence. Um, and I'm wondering if this is a scatter versus true right, RV uptake. It looks like RV uptake, except uh, sternum is a little bit more anterior. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the question. Um, the upper limit would be set quite high because of there's mm -hmm. so much myocardial activity. There's no scatter from the ribs or from the, mm -hmm. the spine. Um, so I would tend to call it um, RV uptake. Okay. Um, um, this patient is post-tavir, has hypertension, CAD, and lesion in the mid LAD, uh, spine surgery. Uh, EF is low, um, and there's biatrial dilation, diastolic dysfunction grade three to four. Exactly. Okay. So um, I wonder if we want to pull in any of the audience. I, I see some nuclear medicine physicians who probably- Sure. Anybody volunteering to uh, take on the case? Just unmute yourselves, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> well, maybe not, that's okay. Um, well, I'm pretty sure. Shall I pick one of you uh, guys? I, I can see some of our residents uh, who, who also report okay. pyrophosphate scans. Go ahead. How about you, Deborah? I'm actually driving, so I can't look at it very well. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. laughs> you're off the hook. Okay, you're off the hook. All right, so I'll pick Nabil if he is there. Are you there, Nabil? Can, can I okay. also use driving as an excuse? No, no. Okay. It, it's being used. <laughs> All right, uh, sure. So uh, when looking at the planar images, you can definitely make out oh, uh, quite prominent cardiac uh, uptake uh, significantly higher than the surrounding ribs, uh, as well as likely significant uh, contralateral to heart ratio. Um, so just the planars alone, I would very heavily be leaning towards a positive, positive study. Um, and then when you're looking at the spec images, uh, you can see quite prominent uptake within the septum, but also on the lateral wall. Um, it seems that the uptake is throughout the left ventricle. So again, I'd be leaning towards a positive study. Yeah. If you look at the planar, I think you can see like a myocardial pattern with um, absence of uptake in the blood pool area. Yes, on the planar, you can even identify maybe the uh, middle of the ventricle here, right? The blood pool uh, area, yeah. the cavity versus the wall, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, Nabil, do you think there's RV uptake? Um. The 
maybe uh there does seem to be very slight amount but it does seem to be uh i'm not sure if it's uh ventricles whether it's within the ventricle itself or uh like blood pool activity versus right ventricle it seems like it's more blood pool as opposed to true right ventricle activity if you go to the ct does that help you say that that activity is in the rv yeah, the, the CT makes it seem more like it's blood pool. Yeah, and the other point is, if you got scatter from the sternum, it should be hottest adjacent to the scatter or to the sternum and fading out as it moves away from the this, this, this sternum. And we have the exact opposite if you look at the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So there might be a focal uptake right here, um, but I think, of course, this is 3D, but not 3D. This is just a transaxial. If you know, if we look at the coronal and sagittal images, probably we will be able to say more confidently that it's in the RV. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the emphasis on the RV comes from a need to risk stratify patients to some degree, and that may determine uh, who really would benefit from therapy versus not. The worse your prognosis, the more you should benefit. But there's also data suggesting when you have RV uptake, your prognosis is poor and treatment may not actually help you that much. Yeah. Um, so I'll show one more. I think we're running out of time unless there's questions. Um, um, we can just maybe scroll through faster on these cases. Sure. Would you like to go ahead, Dr. Reddy? Sure. This is a patient with hypertrophic okay. cardiomyopathy who had uh, a lot of things happening in ICD, heart block. He has hypertension. His, his a cardiac MR showed a very high ECV, which is consistent with an infiltrative cardiomyopathy or lots of scar, which could be his hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The, um, there was felt to be a need to find something treatable, and TTR amyloid is a treatable disease. So I think added some need to have this uh, PYP scan. Um, Sina, what do you think? So, so I do see a silhouette here, uh, again, on the planar images. It definitely is greater than one. I'm not sure if it would make it to 1.5, but again, it's irrelevant. Um, I look at the SPEC and SPEC CT images, and um, I, I cannot differentiate actually much. I don't see myocardial contours. Um, all I see is a, a blood pool. Yeah, it's very much blood pool. A lot of atrial blood pool. I think you could argue for some LV blood pool. Um, but given the abnormality on MRI, like they should look for light chains, maybe it's AL. Yeah. So routine in our lab is to do the blood work in your work prior to or at the near the time of the PYP. So we have the results at the time we interpret the PYP. Okay. Here's another one. So a 76-year-old man with a woman with hep hep atrial fib, hypertension, um, apical sparing uh, on her echo, MRI, you see here, diffuse scattering, you know, um, she also has AL based on uh, lambda light chains. So the question is to interpret the, the uh, spec and the spec CT. Yeah, so I can't really identify um, myocardial uptake here. It looks blood pool again. Very smooth filter, but still, I you know, I would expect a bit more definition for myocardium. The patient also has a fusion, um, so I would I would say this is a, this is a negative scan. Yeah, there's also a hot spot yeah. towards the apex. Yeah, and I wondered if it's the rib. Uh, is yeah. there a fracture here? Maybe exactly. Um, so or or is it? A, yeah, you're right. That's a rib fracture with scar. Yeah. So a negative. And... Very good. Um, so these are important things to identify on images, like uh, things can affect the, the way um, the adjacent structures can affect and add counts or still counts. Mm -hmm. and here's another patient. Um, A patient with coronary disease, remote atrial fib, hep, hep. Uh, echo showed severe by atrial dilation. Um, and, and as you mentioned, uh, when there's severe atrial biatrial dilation, there is an increased pooling of the tracer. And, and uh, we see a clear um, 
blood pool activity. And this was at uh, two and a half hours after injection? Yeah, yes. I would say this is really a very high level of blood pool. Um, yeah. And oh, we're at the end of the cases. So um, any questions and answers? Uh, well, questions from you, answers are from Dr. Ruddy. Sure. We'll <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Catherine thinks you're a full Jedi Knight. <laughs> I'm a Jedi in training. <laughs> So um, any questions from audience uh, about the cases, how we interpret what, what the importance of uh, doing all four criteria, like going through all four for the diagnosis? Let's see. How long does it take to become a Jedi master? Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, it's a very long road. It depends who your master is, I guess. <laughs> Some yeah, students faster. quicker than others. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I guess with this, uh, I will stop sharing the screen and I will move on to our last speaker, a very important topic on treatment options and uh, how to manage these patients. And... Uh, so Dr. Davy is also our um, Western crew and, um, oops, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that. Is, um, all right, so Dr. Davy has completed his residency training um, uh, in in, the, in London, Ontario, but he moved to Pittsburgh where he did uh, a two-year advanced heart failure transplant and left ventricular assist device and pulmonary hypertension fellowship. Um, and from there, he came back. And so he's, uh, he's the... Um, so he's an associate professor and is the medical lead for LVAT program. He also runs the cardiac amyloidosis clinic in Western. Dr. Davy. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I would like to go through some uh, current amyloid treatment strategies. We've kind of discussed some of these things already. First of all, as we know, there really are two forms, AL amyloid, which is a bone marrow disease, and transthyretin amyloidosis, which is a liver protein, which is really there to transport vitamin A. And as we know, it acts badly and can develop uh, significant symptoms uh, in hereditary forms. Uh, and you can see some of the common hereditary forms of which we have all of them here in London, Ontario. Um, it can have both a cardiac and a peripheral neuropathy phenotype. And in the wild type um, has more of a cardiac uh, phenotype with some additional, as you can see here, musculoskeletal involvement as well, especially with carpal tunnel and spinal stenosis as we've talked about before. So um, this is also something that we've kind of been discussing, and that is how do you diagnose it? And this is our own uh, work up here in London, and I kind of put this together many years ago uh, now after Cheatham came to me and said, would you be interested if we started doing pyrophosphate scanning? So I thought, hmm, I better come up with some sort of flow to diagnose folks with either TTR, TTR or AL in our center. And luckily we can do all that testing here in London, both pyrophosphate scanning, molecular test is done at University Hospital. Uh, molecular testing is done at Victoria Hospital along with the free light chains and immunofixation. And we have a 
uh, bone marrow stem cell transplant program uh, here as well, as long as well as a very obviously active hematology program. And so it's great to have all of this uh, in place. And of course, for those who are positive genetic testing, we have um, very skilled and interested neurologists, as well as genetic counseling. So it's kind of everything that we want in order to have a successful program uh, here. And certainly many uh, programs across the country um, have a similar setup. So as we talked about, uh, AL comes from the bone marrow, uh, whereas TTR comes from the liver. And AL is the predominance of free light chains inappropriately produced by the bone marrow. And it pretty much overlaps with multiple myeloma at both its basic level and in clinical treatment. Virtually all organs can be affected. And on echocardiogram, uh, a, a note that really you cannot distinguish between AL amyloid and TTR. And even on pyrophosphate scanning, sometimes you can get that positive uh, uh, a positive P by P scan, despite the fact that it is AL. So just remember that. Um, Mayo Clinic staging is really considered to be the gold standard for AL amyloid uh, staging. And there are a couple of different staging. The Europeans have kind of altered the Mayo Clinic uh, staging. But as you can see, essentially they break it down in stages one through four. And they look at things like troponin, BNP, and change in the free light chains. And depending on what stage you are, it really does predict how well you're going to survive with AL amyloid. The treatment schema, really, we have to think about whether or not the patients are stem cell transplant eligible or not stem cell transplant eligible. And for the most part, it is uh, Cybor D, which is cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. Uh, coupled with daratumumab uh, for a number of cycles. Um, and then they look to see how much response uh, there is. Is there a complete response or very good response? Um, and then they can go on to um, follow up therapy um, and they check for any evidence of relapse. And if there is, then you go on to relapse therapy. Um, and if you've got relapse, um, depending on whether or not you've been exposed to daratumumab or bortezomib, um, then there are a number of different agents. And as you can see, for those especially who have some experience in second line therapies for multiple myeloma, um, you can see there's a lot of overlap uh, between these two. And additionally, um, there are a lot of new agents now which are being looked at um, to target plasma cells and try to reduce the amount of AL that's being produced. So let's shift focus a little bit to TTR. Um, TTR uh, is uh, developed, first of all, it's produced by the, the liver as a monomer. They It should associate into a stable tetramer so that it can continue on doing its job. Um, for reasons that we don't fully understand, uh, as folks get older, uh, this disassembles uh, and can then form the, st the stereotypical beta pleated sheets, which amyloid is named after. And this then assembles into a fibril or a prefibril, which is cytotoxic, and then into a full fibril, which is depositing actually all over the place but especially with wild type, it's mainly affecting the heart. And with uh, hereditary can affect peripheral nerves or the heart. And so we see that here, uh, these dimers should associate into tetramers, but they don't um, in patients who have amyloid and then develop these fibrils, which then sit inside the heart. And so you get increased wall thickness and di initially diastolic dysfunction, but that can eventually turn into systolic dysfunction and also present with arrhythmias such as heart block. Um, and that's an important thing to note. Um, remember that these fibrils are not electrically active. And so when you look at an ECG, you may see very thick wall on your echo, but the ECG voltages might be totally normal. 
Well, if the ECG voltages are totally normal and you've got a very thick heart on echo or some other form of imaging, then you need to really be suspicious that something else is going on here. So if we just sort of um, conceptualize what we think amyloid, TTR amyloid treatments should be, well, we could take that TTR tetramer and try to stabilize it therefore thereby can continue to do its job which is transport vitamin a not a crucial job in 2024 where we can supplement with as much vitamin a as we want we don't really need a we don't really need a, a transport protein nowadays but we could do that um we could disrupt those amyloid fibrils and reduce the overall burden um or we could reduce production of transthyretin by the liver. So all of these therapies have certainly been conceptualized and have been developed. Um, some of them are in full clinical usage and some of them are not. And so I think we'll go through all of them in a little bit of detail over uh, the next little while, um, just so we can have an idea of what they all do. So tefaminus has been mentioned. It is similar. It has this uh, similar structure to NSAIDs, um, and it binds to thyroxin binding sites of both variant and wild type transthyretin uh, with pretty high affinity and selectivity. By binding to those native forms, it prevents that tetramer from breaking down, and that's that first step that we want to try to avoid. And so it was first looked at in, in uh, peripheral neuropathy and subsequently has been looked at in the ATTRACT trial, as we said, published actually quite a few number of years ago now, almost six years ago uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it showed a 30% reduction in the risk of all-cause mortality uh, compared to placebo. And really, this was the first treatment we had um, for cardiac amyloid and really changed the entire uh, structure of this. We went from what I referred to as before the placebo era of cardiac amyloid treatment now to the treatment era. Um, and so there's a 33% uh, reduction actually if you um, don't treat heart transplant or cardiac uh, mechanical assist device as death. So as you can see, significant reduction. Um, and if you look at uh, the rate of CV hospitalizations, for example, uh, the number needed to treat just to prevent a cardiovascular hospitalization was four. Um, and so, you know, this is cer certainly interesting uh, when we think about the economics of how heart failure is treated and uh, the cost of drugs as uh, as a whole. This is something that I often uh, talk to my patients about, and that is that it really does blunt the loss of the six-minute walk uh, distance uh, compared to placebo. And so that's, I think, important. Uh, patients often, the average age in the cardiac amyloid clinic in London is 81 or 82. Um, and so folks are maybe not looking so much at the uh, mortality benefit uh, as they are as the quality of life benefit. And so also the KCCQ scores were pretty well maintained uh, compared to the placebo group. So what about some other treatments? So we have two other currently uh, approved treatments um, that are available. We actually have some others as well that are actually available, but there's two that are generally available, and that is inotercin and patisseran. They silence at the RNA level TTR and prevent the liver from producing the TTR protein. Inotercin is an antisense uh, oglionucleotide, and patisseran is a small interfering RNA molecule. So you can see how they work just very slightly differently, but at the end of the day, they turn off RNA, uh, so it's not available to be translated into a protein. Obviously, these patients need to be treated with a vitamin A um, supplementation because, of course, now you've turned off whatever um, working 
uh, transthyretin they had. Um, Iotericin is a once uh, is a subcutaneous injection weekly. Um, Patisserin is IV infusion, but is only every three weeks. Um, it's a little bit more. Um, you can do it at home. The Iotericin Patisserin may require a clinic uh, site uh, visit. Uh, but could be done. Uh, we have, especially during COVID, had patients uh, infused at home, and we still have many patients being infused at home. Um, I know Tercin, what is not mentioned here, has a significant uh, increased chance of very severe uh, low platelet levels. And even in the study, some patients have passed away as a result. And so this is actually only approved at present in hereditary polyneuropathy patients. Um, some of those patients may have some cardiac disease as well, but at this point, uh, it's only approved for that and it's only funded in Ontario for that. Uh, Apollo B was a phase three study, which looked at uh, patisserin and looked at uh, wild type or uh, mutated uh, TTR and gave patisserin every three weeks versus placebo and looked at things like change in six minute walk distance, um, KCCQ scores, death hospitalizations. And so as you can see here, there were some positive uh, results uh, reported and uh, full results were presented uh, some time ago now at the uh, International uh, Amyloid Society meeting. Uh, which took place in Germany in 2022 and did show some uh, positive results. Um, I have to admit the numbers were relatively small, especially as compared with the ATRAC study. And so as you can see here, six minute walk was improved. Uh, KCCQ uh, also uh, was maintained uh, and uh, all cause mortality didn't quite meet along with CV events didn't quite meet um, target. So uh, what about some new agents uh, with amyloid? Well, there is a new uh, stabilizer currently awaiting uh, FDA approval, and that's Acormetis, also known as uh, AG10. Uh, there are two new silencers, which have been approved by the FDA for use in variant TTR, polyneuropathy, uh, Eplontericin, which is known as Wainua, and Vitisseran, which is Mvutra. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, both of them actually now are also available. They both, uh, not I believe, they both are now both recently available in Canada as well. And there are some, a number of TTR depletements, uh, depleters in development. So that's that final pathway that we were talking about. And Alexion 2220, which I'm told is going to be referred to as Claramatug, um, also known as NI006, currently being studied in a phase three trial called the depleter uh, study. Uh, there's also another study using CRISPR. So CRISPR is a genetic uh, technique which permanently changes someone's uh, genetic makeup. And that's also being looked at. It'll be the first in human CRISPR study done and it will be done in the TTR uh, protein. Uh, as far as the attribute, which is uh, the study which um, looked at a Acormetis, so it looked at uh, 800 milligrams twice daily versus placebo. Um, the patients were a slightly different population than a tract. Um, they were slightly less, uh, uh, less sick. Um, and so looked at that population and uh, as you can see, uh, they were studied in a two-to-one fashion. Um, and then had also a very similar uh, statistical method to attract. And they had a hierarchical uh, analysis, actually, looking at all-cause mortality, uh, CV hospitalizations, antiprobian P change, and six-minute walk change. Uh, and then use this win ratio. And so... Um, in the end, there was a 25% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality and a 30% relative risk reduction in CV mortality, um, which gave a number needed to treat for death or first cardiovascular hospitalization of uh, seven. 
And as you can see here, the curves start to diverge around three to four months and stay diverged um, over the course of the entire study. Iplon Tersen um, is being studied in the CardioTransform study. We're expecting uh, data in uh, early as you know, 2025. I suspect we might get it even a little bit sooner. Um, and definitely the most comprehensive study to date in TTR cardiomyopathy using Iplon Tersen, which is a modified molecule similar to inotersin, but modified to get rid of the platelet issues uh, that were inherent to inotersin. Additionally, it will be targeted at cardiomyopathy. And then finally, Helios B, uh, which is a phase three study looking at Vutisiran, which is a sub-Q once every three months um, versus placebo. Uh, so really only need four shots a year. Um, and uh, the primary endpoint is reduction in all-cause mortality and recurrent CV events, uh, along with improvement in six-minute walk distance or blunting of six-minute walk distance, KCCQ, echo parameters, all-cause mortality, um, all-cause hospitalization, heart flare events, uh, and recurrent CV events, along with NT-Pro BNP. Um, and so... Uh, the top line results were expected in early 2024, and I can tell you, I had to add this slide last night, <laughs> slash today, the top line results were just released yesterday, and uh, Vutisaran did meet the primary endpoint of all-cause mortality and CV mortality in both the total population. Remember, the total population, some of them would have been on to famitis. And their hazard ratio was 0 0.718 with a p-value of quite respectable 0 0.01. And in the monotherapy without tefamidus usage, which represented about half of the total population, the hazard ratio was even better uh, at 0.672. It also met significance in, I think, if most, if not all, secondary endpoints. And so the full paper, I'm sure, will be uh, released soon. So stay tuned for that. So cardiac amyloid can really fall into two subtypes and can be characterized by symptoms of heart failure uh, and arrhythmias with increased ventricular wall thickness. Uh, blood work, including serum-free light chains and imaging is uh, crucial to making a diagnosis along with uh, nuclear medicine scanning, especially pyrophosphate scanning is what is used most commonly in Canada. Tissue biopsy may be necessary to diagnose uh, AL amyloid, and there are treatments for both AL and TTR amyloid. Um, and as you saw, these are going to get progressively more complicated. And uh, at present, certainly our expert centers, I think, are best positioned to provide this care to uh, the patient population. So uh, thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Davy. This this was an eye opener. I didn't know there were this many options. Only just what uh, seven eight years ago, we didn't have any options. All right, um, there's one hand up here. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Uh, Al Latani. Yeah, thank you for this really uh, really uh, huge options that we have for these poor patients. My question, though, is something a little bit different because, you know, uh, we know that the, the the mechanism of sudden cardiac death for these patients usually is pulseless electrical activity. If I have a patient with amylido cardiac amyloidosis and uh, like he satisfies criteria to send for an ICD, would you be hesitant to, to put an ICD or you go ahead? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, first of all, I, you know, I want to step back and just talk about heart block itself. It, it, you know, certainly when we see these patients in clinic, I warn them all about heart block. We don't, you know, it's probably about 10% of patients go on to develop significant symptomatic heart block. Interestingly, at the beginning, when, you know, we first started setting up the clinic, uh, I looked back at the ECGs and everyone had an abnormal ECG of some extent. Many had atrial fibrillation 
and the ones who were in sinus all had first degree AV block. So there clearly is a lot of heart block. And so I always am careful to warn patients uh, that if they have symptoms of syncope, they need to go into the emergency room. They need to let us know. They almost certainly need a uh, consideration for a pacemaker. Now, ICD, as far as ICD goes, as we know, the, the standard um, indication for ICD placement for primary prevention is someone who has an EF of less than 30%. And in this case, many patients sometimes do have an EF of less than 30%, so they would meet the standard indication. So if they meet those standard indications, I generally don't hesitate to have that discussion with them. Now, that being said, some of these patients, as I said, the median age in the clinic is like 82. So some of these patients are 90 years old. I speak to them about it. They say, absolutely not. This is not something I would want. So you always have that conversation. But in somebody who we have many patients, obviously, in their 70s, and if their EF is low, then I don't hesitate to, to obviously send them along for ICD implantation if they want it. Um, as far as uh, ventricular arrhythmias in general, they are probably under-recognized in this population. There is a higher burden of ventricular arrhythmias for sure in patients who have cardiac amyloid, and the jury is still out as to who we offer ICDs for in the non-traditional primary prevention population, meaning their EFs are preserved. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. No, uh, that's that's really important. And uh, Dr. Tani connects from Thunder Bay. Am I right? That's right. I'm 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 in Thunder yeah. Bay. Yes. Yes. Um, so right, so in be... terms of <laughs> yes, absolutely. So th this is this is very important to reach out uh, everywhere across Canada, across Ontario, firstly, but. Uh, um, now that we know these these medications take some time to actually show some effect and show some changes, and some of them are IV infusion, some of them are subcutaneous, some of them are oral, um, like very convenient. Um, take you know they can be taken at home. Um, is there any comparison with these medications? If any of them is better in terms of you know when when you assess them longitudinally, if one of them works faster. Or we don't, we don't know, you know, it's very interesting, Helios B um, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Cardio Transform will be really our first foray into uh, combination therapy uh, because patients who were eligible to be on Tefamis and had it available in their jurisdiction were on it. Um, it would be unethical to not offer them it with the results of the track study. So I think, you know, and I know Cheatham, you and I have discussed this as well about, you know, what do we do with non-responders? We often send our folks here in London for repeat uh, PYP scanning after they've been on therapy. And, uh, you know, Cheatham and I have a little game where she sends me uh a uh, repeat PYP scan, and I have to guess which one of the patients have not responded to therapy and which ones have. And so we've been pretty good. We've been pretty good at, at figuring that out. Um, and so- and We figured that the pyrophosphate images are actually correlating with the clinical you know, responsiveness, but uh, we still don't know actually what they will all will will need will will mean in the end but yeah there it's very good correlation exactly and so you know in those non-responders and especially into feminist non-responders i think this is where we're going to have to look at second line agents um and adding on a second agent um and i think that's probably where we'll be moving to i'm sure the the payers, um, the ministry and private insurance companies are not excited to hear that uh, because these these therapies are quite expensive. But we don't know what will happen with costs either as more and more therapies come on the market. Um, there was a question in the chat. Oh, if amyloid deposition led to cardiac arrhythmia post-therapy, can the arrhythmia resolve? Uh, it, 
perhaps generally speaking, we don't have we don't have any way of of targeting the removal right now of uh, amyloid fibrils from the heart. Um, we do have a couple trials. There will be a um, a trial uh, that we'll be doing here in London. We've already activated it. Um, looking at a monoclonal antibody, a human monoclonal antibody, uh, to remove cardiac amyloid um, or move t target TTR amyloid removal. Um, and so we'll just have to see how that, you know, what comes of that. Um, but generally speaking, the uh, thought process has been once it's in there, it's in there. Um, and you're unlikely to get much improvement from a TTR perspective. From AL, sometimes you do see a little bit of improvement, um, but it's usually not that substantial. If you've got really significant cardiac involvement from AL, uh, even after treatment, you're going to see at most a modest improvement in, in our experience. Thank you. Very interesting. Well, thank you. Um, is there anything else, any questions that we have missed or, or any other uh, input from the panel? Dr. D, Dr. Ruddy, please. Because I don't do the treatment. No, no, no questions. I think the session went really well, though, and it's really nice to close with treatment. This treatment will improve patient care, and that's why we do the imaging. Ryan, these treatments are expensive. Is that going to be an issue as we move on with more patients and uh, more complications? I think, yeah, I think so. You know, um, certainly we don't know. Tefamidus is the is the accepted treatment right now. The list price is one hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars per year per patient. We don't know exactly in Ontario what the ministry is paying Pfizer because. No one's privy to that information other than the ministry and Pfizer. Um, but we have to assume that it's a large number. And, you know, we don't have it, you know, in uh, here in London, uh, we have, I believe at this point, I've lost count, but last count was around 140 patients on Tefamidus. And that's just, it, like I said, in one center in one province. Um, so, you know the overall cost to the system is going to be very high, and exactly as exactly as you say, if we start to add on a second therapy, um, you know the list price. I don't know what the list price is of patisseran, for example, in Canada, but in the U.S., the list price is four hundred thousand dollars U.S. per year. So, you know, um, so we're talking about a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So I think there should be some effort to look at response. Yeah, I think so. Um, we we can't just all of a sudden use a start using a machine gun approach um, and start saying, well, that's okay. We've approved dual therapy, so everybody goes on dual therapy. Uh, we could, you know, um, do a lot of things, obviously, with that money. And so we just need to be careful we're using it. That being said, many of the patients that we see that I see in my clinic are, are elderly uh, folks who have been healthy their entire lives and they've been paying taxes their entire lives. So yeah. I think they're in some ways um, uh, owed it. Exactly, I would treat, I would look at the treatment response and non-responders, you change drugs, you definitely do that. If the second choice drug is not that effective, then no drug might be the end result. That's right. Yeah. No, this is all very good. But thank you, um, everyone, uh, all the excellent speakers and, and the attendees and staying with us um, this evening. And uh, I hope you, uh, you benefited from the session. And uh, here's the QR code. It's also put in the chat box um, for, for evaluation of the session. And you can claim two hours of CME credits. Um, and the session is also being recorded. Um, and we will send you an online um, on-demand link if you need to uh, go back and, and check things again. Um, and again, thank you so much. Thank you.